Welcome to Category 5 Technology TV, episode number 350. What? We realized it's episode number 350 tonight, so we wanted to, to do something extra special for you. So we decided just before the show that this is going to be the best show ever. Of course. You don't want to miss out on this. Tonight we are going to break Linux. What? We are. We're going to break it. Ooh. And then we're going to show you how to fix it <laughs> using CH root from a live Linux CD. Hmm. Don't miss that. It's going to be incredibly nerdy. <laughs> That's how we like it. Incredibly nerdy around here. Fortunately, Hillary Rumble is here to kind of bring us down, <laughs> l- lose some of the nerdy edge to the show. Right on. Because seriously, if it was just me, CH root, Linux live, Booting into the system, hacking away. Who knows what would happen Watch out. if I wasn't here to uh, keep things under control. Luckily, I'm also here to tell you what's coming up in the newsroom. Brilliant. Yeah. The NSA is harvesting pictures online to build its facial recognition system. Whoa. Let's give them one. Your turn. <laughs> That's the face I want. That's the one. That's what I want. That's the one. (laughs) Um, The Universal Translator is real and will be coming to Skype. The modern car is a computer on wheels just waiting to be hacked by someone like this guy. And lastly, Google is building satellites to provide internet service to the world at large. So stick around because these stories are coming up later in our show. Hillary, you have to be careful. They have my picture now. All right. Man, no, it's internet. It's out there. I know. I know. It's going to be a fun show. Don't go away. This is Category 5 Technology TV. Starring Sasha Dermatis. Hillary Rumble. Krista Wells. Eric Kidd. And your host, Robbie Ferguson. Introducing Belltone First, a revolutionary new hearing aid. So small you can hardly see it. So comfortable you can hardly feel it. For the first time ever, you can control hearing aids directly from your iPhone. Pick up the phone, listen to music, and use your hearing aids like wireless headphones. Hear everything that matters. Try Belltone First. For a free trial, call 1-800-BELLTONE now. This is Category 5 Technology TV. I'm your host, Robbie Ferguson. And I'm Hillary Rumble. So Ka- good to see you. Welcome, everyone. Sorry. I, was I, just gonna, I stepped on your words. It's okay. I was just going just gonna to tell everyone that Category 5.TV is a member of the Tech Podcast Network. If it's tech, it's here. You can check that out at cat5.tv slash tpn. And we're also a member of the International Association of Internet Broadcasters, cat5.tv slash iaib. And that is what I have to say at this moment. I'd also like to say at this moment, hello to the World Wide Web tuning hello. in. Hello. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Our We're chat so room glad. Is very active tonight. Hi, Stripe. To see everybody. The chat room is so wild and fun and full of fun people. And I'd also like to give a special shout out to Flo. Tennessee Frank has uh, roped you in to watch the show, and it's about time. That's all I got to say. So we are so glad you could tune in with us, and we hope you enjoy the show. This is really perfect, Flo, because tonight is the best show ever. Yeah, yeah. Kyoshi Ninja is in the chat room and says, yes, (laughs) I've always wanted to know about CH Root. This is an exciting topic, and to that I say, you, sir, are a nerd. And so this show is for you. (laughs) I'm very excited, too. So, uh... Yeah, this is going to be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. A lot of fun. You know, speaking of fun, I got to switch the P- 
Parity Drive in our Unraid server. You heard about it last week. Thank you to everybody who contributed <laughs> some uh, some money, basically. Uh, how else do I say it? Thanks for sending <laughs> in some money because it costed money to replace the drive. Mm. Appreciate that very, very much, and it helped offset the expense. So we put a 4 terabyte Parity Drive in there. Mm. We cleared it, pre-cleared it, and got it building. I did. And then uh, one of the data drives... In our array, so one of the drives that actually holds data, not the parity drive. Remember, I don't have a parity drive right now because I'm in the middle of building it. Right. One of the data drives failed. Ooh. Yikes! Brutal. Here's where I'm so thankful to be using Unraid because, well, there's two things I'm thankful for. One, I use Unraid, mm-hmm. not a standard striped array where, oh no, I've lost one drive, now everything is gone. No. With Unraid, mm-hmm. only the data on that one individual drive could be lost but thankfully here's number two i have good backups of course you do we encourage you to have good backups (laughs) i see it all the time people who have a hard drive crash we had a power surge last night here in barry huge storm came through yeah it was massive it was fierce (laughs) and it lasted 18 seconds but long enough to take down trees Mm -hmm. long enough to take out computers through power spikes and just you know computer after computer coming in with failed hard drives unable to get data off of my hard drive because i had a good backup we were able to finish building parity replace the failed hard drive Mm -hmm. copy the backup over to the new hard drive well the old parity drive which i had moved into the place of the old or of the failed hard drive right and then copy the data back and we've got parity and we're good to go didn't lose a thing Thankfully. Phew. But thinking about <laughs> how a traditional RAID works, had I lost two drives and say, you know, like a, a standard RAID set, mm-hmm. you could possibly lose everything on all of those drives. Yikes. Brutal. So once again, UnRAID saves the day. Um, hey. We've got lots of information on our website, category5.tv, episode 103. Mm-hmm. While it's old, it's a must view. Yes. And if you're on Roku, you know that I say, probably don't go back to some of the old episodes, because at least not right at the get-go when you're getting to know us, because they're old. They're very mm-hmm. low quality. But <laughs> that's one of the ones, content-wise, you need to watch that. Thanks. Big thanks to Jot, who was in the chat room and mm-hmm. knows quite a bit about Unraid. And, and this is one of the unique things about our community. Not only can you go into our chat room and say, guys, i got a problem. Ladies, I've got a problem because we've got some ladies, as we know, in the chat oh, room tonight yeah. as well. And, uh, you know, can you guys help? And I do that. I went into the chat room when my drive failed. and said, anyone able to help? And Jot mm-hmm. piped up and said, here, and gave me resource after resource, links to the forum threads that were appropriate, a download for the pre-clear script. Perfect. And that's our community. Totally. And, you know, that even I tap into this community because <laughs> we're so much more than just a TV show here, folks. So uh, get on uh, over to our website. Become a part of this great community. Mm-hmm. It's category5.tv. Absolutely free for you to participate in the show. Uh, it's interactive, and we'd encourage you to register on our website, category5.tv. Do it. Do it. That's what I say. I am excited. Battle of the Bands is coming up this Friday night. Mm -hmm. We've shown some video clips on the show in previous years. But Sasha and I are actually going to be there judging Battle of the Bands this year. That'll be awesome. Just a fun little, you know, it's a fun event for the youth that are involved. I guess um, it's basically young people who Mm -hmm. are aspiring musicians and have got their bands together and practiced a bunch of songs. And they get up on an awesome stage with a big old sound system with (laughs) full lights and smoke machines and everything. LEDs these days. <laughs> Lights are getting smaller, cooler, oh, I know. lighter it's wild. weight. It's pretty yeah. wild. So that's a fun event, and Sasha and I are going to be there. If you're in Barrie, drop me a line. We'll give you all the deets. Sounds good. You should come out and check it out. Do it, people. Yeah. Well, Kyoshi Ninja is on the edge of his seat. <laughs> what do I do? I have purposefully broken Linux. Oh, no. What does that even mean? I know. Okay. There are a few times where you can break Linux doing configuration stuff. Hmm. A good example would be working on your X configuration for your graphics drivers, something like that, upgrading your graphics drivers. And all of a sudden, you can't boot in Hmm. because your graphic drivers are botched. So you boot up your computer, and you boot up your computer, and there's nothing there and you can't boot it and oh my goodness <laughs> what in do you that do? well in that scenario 
Here's another scenario that falls under this category. FS tab. Hmm. You've edited your FS tab file. You forgot to do a sudo mount dash A to test it first. And instead you rebooted. And as you rebooted, you went, oh, no. Robbie said I'm supposed to run sudo mount dash A first. Hmm. But I forgot. <laughs> and I accidentally typoed in my FS tab file. So now my computer won't boot. I've got no access to my hard drives. I can't do anything. So in those scenarios, here's where Linux is great help. Hmm. You can boot up from a Linux Live CD. You can browse to the hard drive. You can edit the FS tab file. You can edit the xorg.comp file. You can Ooh. edit those configuration files and fix your computer by simply editing them and rebooting. Hmm. Easy, that right? That seems easy. But there are scenarios where that just isn't good enough. Dang. Would you like to hear about one of them? Sounds frightening. I was on site at a customer's site, for lack of a second word. <laughs> I was there. Yeah. In person. Because mm -hmm. Robbie does this stuff. So I was sitting at their server, which is a very comfortable server room, as they all are. Mm. <clears throat> and I ran an apt get update, and it worked great. Cool. And I ran an apt get upgrade because we're upgrading this, you know, mm -hmm. upgrading all the components. I'm there. Might as well do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everything went great. Somewhere in that script. I've never had this happen before. Okay. I've never had it ha <laughs> happen since, but it does and can happen. Oh. Somewhere along the line, it tried to do a kernel update and failed. Oh. I was left with a system, a server, mind you. So their whole I yeah. company infrastructure is based on this server. Running Debian with a hypervisor. In the hypervisor was all their domain controller, their uh, web server. Everything is, mm -hmm. is in a virtual machine, separate individual virtual machines. The hypervisor is the one that I was updating. So no kernel means, guess what? Can't boot your computer. Uh oh. There it is, folks. Well, what am I going to do with minimal bash-like line editing support? Okay, for the first word, tab list, possible command completions. What? Anywhere? Okay, so well, what do you do? LS. Oh. Okay, well, uh, start X. No, that's an unknown command. You're stuck. I've got no kernel on my computer because something happened mm -hmm. during the update. Now, I'm giving you an extreme case because this actually happened to me. This could be anything. Say you updated a package. Your graphic drivers is a good example. Of course, you can go into xorg.conf and fall back to NVIEW or something like that. That's a good fix. But in our case, we want to actually fix the graphic drivers or we want to actually fix the fact that I have no kernel on my computer. And literally, when I boot, that's all I get. I've got no way to do anything. You can mount the drive and try to figure out how to get it going. It's just not going to happen. So what I'm going to do instead, I'm going to pop in my live CD. I've got, now this particular computer, mm -hmm. I'll just say is a point Linux 3 point no, 2.3.1, pardon me. <laughs> I had to think about that. Point Linux 2.3.1, which is Debian. Mm -hmm. Debian 7.1, I think. Um, needless to say, one of the first considerations as I'm doing this is I want to use a boot CD that is of the same architecture at least, but uh, so if it's a 64-bit computer, I need to use a 64-bit boot disk. If it's a 32-bit, mm -hmm. uh, not computer, pardon me, if it's a 64-bit installation that I'm trying to fix or a 32-bit right. installation that I'm trying to fix, I need to use the same architecture. Even better is to have the same version of the distro itself. Because then you know you're going to have all the dependencies, all the stuff that you need on that particular boot disk. Now that I've got that disk in the drive, mm -hmm. I'm going to try restarting my computer. Okay, let's see. Let's see what, what happens. happens here. Okay, so now with the Point Linux CD in the drive, it gives me the option to try Point Linux without installing. Here we go. So it's going to boot up Point Linux into this computer. So keep in mind right now what I'm actually doing, Hill, mm -hmm. is I'm booting that broken computer, so my kernel is completely botched mm -hmm. or whatever is broken, I'm booting into a live CD. Linux has got this great thing where you can boot the CD, you can get a fully functional Linux desktop without ever having to install it. Hmm. 
it also works really, really well for fixing things. Okay. Valid. Yes. Well, you can <laughs> see here, you know, it's booting up. I'm not getting any errors this time. That's great, but I'm not actually booting the computer per se. I'm not booting the, the installed installation of Point Linux. I'm actually booting the basically temporary Point Linux operating system that is installed on this CD, which I've downloaded for free from pointlinux.org. I should mention that the processes that I'm showing you today are perfectly cross distro compatible. So if you're using Arc, if you're using Debian, if you're using Ubuntu, if you're using Manjaro, whatever you're using, these methods are going to be the same. Now, if you're on Fedora, say, for example, or, you know, something like that, obviously, when I do an apt-get update, you're going to have to, you know, modify that command to support your package manager, yum, or something like that. But in our case, we're going to be using apt-get, but the process itself to chroot into a system is going to be the same. So this is booting up. You'll notice that booting from a CD is incredibly slow. I had a lot of time to talk a whole lot of stuff, <laughs> right? Because you're booting from a CD. CDs are really, really slow media. But we're in, okay? You did it. But if I go home folder, you'll notice that I'm looking at nothing. There's nothing here. If I go into anything, my user doesn't even exist. You know, my home folder contains a user called user. Huh. That's not me. If I go into my terminal, you'll see that I am user at point Linux. So I'm actually booted on this point Linux computer, so to speak, using this boot CD. Now, my computer is actually called Narf Dog, <coughs> just so Narf you know. Dog. Narf Dog. So that's the computer that we're going to fix. Being that we're booted from a live CD, now I can browse to the computer. I can see that there is an 85 gigabyte file system, and if I browse to it, it mounts it. And then I can see my real home folder. Oh, there's the Robbie folder. Oh, there you and are. I can do data recovery. I can start copying my documents and my desktop and my pictures. I can, I can simply do that to copy these things. Mm -hmm. I could copy that whole folder to a USB drive just to know that I have a safe backup now. Mm -hmm. So live CDs can be used for that. Where we run into a snag here is it's not the f file system per se. I mean, the operating system itself is not broken. We didn't edit our uh, you know, FS tab file, which we can do here. Let's see, FS tab. So I could edit that. I've got to be root in order to actually save any changes. But if I broke it, I can edit it and I can save it to that hard drive, reboot, and fix it. No problem. That's on my hard drive in the ETC folder. Right? Where we've got a problem is if I go into the boot folder, guess what? I have no kernel. Where's my kernel? You're going to see a package called Linux-image and then the name of your kernel. Well, I don't have one. My system's been botched during an update. I'm using this as a scenario to give you a right. worst case scenario. Yes, of course. This isn't necessarily exactly the problem you're going to have, and that's why I want to show you that there are other <laughs> things that you may be able to fix using this method. Good to know. All right, so what we're going to do, and this shows also, I should say, this is going to show you why Linux is, is cat's pajamas. Is that still a thing? <laughs> uh, I don't know, do the kids say that these days? I'm going to go with no, but... Uh, All right. It's really groovy, yo. Linux. At least you stepped it up a couple decades, but still not quite right. there. Anyways, and keep going. Boss, man. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay, so let's close out of this because we know that we've got a botch system. What do we got to do? It's actually really, really easy. This is going to take us five minutes, but it's going to take us about a half hour because I'm going to explain everything. Yeah. Sudo. Become super user. <laughs> Fdisk. Meh. Dash L is going to show us a list of all our hard drives in the computer, uh. our partitions on those hard drives. I see SDA1. That is really, really tiny. I know that that is my swap drive because it's so incredibly small. <clears throat> SDA2, on the other hand, is rather large, 83 gigs. And I know from here that it's an 85 gig file system mm -hmm. that my computer is detecting. So I know that is actually my hard drive. Brilliant. Okay. 
So let's make a folder that we're gonna mount that hard drive to. I'm gonna put it in the mount folder so I can go cd slash mnt, and if I do an ls, there's nothing there. I'm gonna go sudo because I have to be the super user in order to edit anything in the mnt folder. I need to make a directory. Make dir dash p, and you're gonna know why I do that in just a second. I'm gonna go my drive slash boot. Okay, so what I'm actually doing there is I'm saying create a folder within MNT because that is where I am and it is called boot, but it's going to create boot in a folder called my drive. That folder doesn't exist yet, so we're going to do dash P to make sure that we create folders that are missing and it's going to create my drive slash boot if I hit enter. Now, just for the sake of accuracy because I don't want you to accidentally put this in the wrong place, we're going to actually do this longhand. I can go make dir dash P slash mnt slash my drive slash boot with the sudo at the beginning. Hit enter. Now if I do an ls you're going to see that we've got a folder called my drive. That can be called anything but we're just using that for the scenario. If I ls that which is to do a directory listing you'll see that there's a folder called boot and the whole thing is empty because all I've done is created a folder. Hmm. There's nothing mounted to it. Now we want to actually do the mounting process so we're going to go sudo mount and notice what did we say? It's dev slash sda2 in my particular case. Okay, so because I did the sudo fdisk-l and it showed my list of hard drives and I determined that SDA2 is my actual hard drive, I'll show you another way to determine that. We've, double, we've clicked on the hard drive on Point Linux, so now it's mounted. Remember I said that? When I double click on it, it mounts it. So if I type sudo mount and hit enter, it will actually give me a list of all the mounted file systems and you'll see that SDA2 is the very one that is mounted in slash media slash and then the UUID, which is this particular hard drive. If I go Control L, you'll see that the file location is in fact that UUID in slash media. So that's another way to determine that this is in fact SDA2 because I've mounted it on Point Linux. So now that I've got that folder, okay, we're going to mount it. Sudo, we have to be a super user in order to do these operations. Mount dev slash SDA2, that is the partition. Okay, SDA is the hard drive, SDA2 is the partition. You notice that there was also SDA1, but that is our swap partition. That's why it's so small. You'd know that if you try to mount it, it'll give you a warning that that's actually a swap drive. Now we're going to go slash mount slash my drive without a trailing slash. Okay, so I'm going to take SDA2, that hard drive, I'm going to mount it on slash my drive. Not sure mm -hmm. if I can do that while it's mounted somewhere else. Let's see. It worked. Okay. Perfect. LS my drive. There it is. Wahoo. Just to be safe, I'm going to right click on it and go unmount from the desktop. So it's removed it from media. And if I do an LS my drive, that unmounted it there too. Cool. Okay. So <laughs> let's remount it. And so I would do that first normally. There we go. Okay. So it's mounted. I can't ch root to it yet because I've got a lot of stuff that's going to break if I try. Mm -hmm. Understanding that ch root means change root. So I'm actually going to basically trick my running Linux into thinking that this hard drive, SDA2, is in fact the hard drive for the running Linux. Ah. Mm -hmm. So then we can do all kinds of things as if we were able to boot it, but we weren't able to boot it. You're going to see that in just a second. So what I need to do... And now I'm working with a very, very simplistic installation here. I'll just note, if you have, for example, your boot partition, things like that on separate partitions on your hard drive, then you need to go through the mount process individually. So, for example, I might, if I've got a separate home drive, I might have to go SDA3, th uh, uh, sorry, home partition, and I might have to put it on home, for example. That's just an example. I don't have that scenario. So for me, we've got our proc which is the proc file system. It gives a file-like structure to uh, all of the processes that are running on your computer. We've also got uh, your dev mm -hmm. folder on your host computer, the one that's actually running mm -hmm. off the CD. Those are the devices that are detected in your computer, right? So if I do an ls slash dev, those are all the devices that are detected. I need to port that over, basically pipe it over to my new ch rooted environment. There's also a folder called slash run, which we also need to do the same thing because these are the running processes. Uh, the, this is actually used uh, by UDEV, as far as I understand, and it's um, part of the, it's like a temp file system for, for it to use. Very, very important to pipe these things over. If you don't understand it all, it's okay. Just follow the steps. sudo mount, okay? So what I'm gonna do is 
dash t proc. That's the file system type is proc. And none. And we're going to put mount my drive slash proc. So we're actually popping this into the proc. We're mounting it on proc in my basically mounted environment, right? Um, so that's all there is to that command. Okay, so now if I do an ls um, slash mount slash my drive slash proc, I'll actually see all the processes that are running on my current huh. install, right? So now I need to do the same, uh, not install, the live CD, sudo mount dash o. Oh, yeah, okay, because <laughs> what we're doing is we're binding this particular folder. What was it? Slash dev. We need to bind that to mount my drive dev because we need to be able to see your dev devices, all your devices mm -hmm. from within our ch rooted environment. So if we don't do that step, we're gonna lose access to all our drives, all of our hardware, all that stuff. We need to do the same thing. What did I say the next one was? Slash run, rum, I almost typed rum. And oh, we're Freudian slip or something. Yeah, I'll say it was, I was thinking Hillary Rumble. Oh, hey -oh. Yeah, okay, so there we go. That's the command. That puts the temp file system for the slash run in there. Now, the moment of truth. Here we go. Look at all that. We now have this crazy mount point in our MNT on a live CD. Ooh. <laughs> what have we done? We have mounted mm -hmm. the proc file system into that mount point. We have mounted the dev folder. Mm -hmm. And we've mounted the run temp file system into that mounted environment. Cool. Okay. Now what we can do, it is now safe to actually ch root into that environment. Sudo ch root. And now here are the two things that we need. MNT my drive, the name of the mount point where I created this magic. <laughs> okay. Whatever you called it, you're going to use it every time. My drive is fine. And then bin bash, because we're going to actually set it up as a ch root environment for bin bash. And there we go. Now, all of a sudden, I've become root. Sorry, what? What? But I'm still on point Linux, right? Let's do cd slash mnt. Because in slash mnt, that's where we created my drive, mm -hmm. right? So let's do an ls. It's gone. What happened? What? Wait a minute. I'm not actually on the live CD anymore. Okay. CD slash boot, ls. <gasps> no kernel. CD slash home, ls. <gasps> Robbie, not user. So I have actually successfully ported Ooh, my session yes. into that mounted hard drive mm -hmm. in my computer. I can fix anything. And I'm not talking just the typical traditional live mm -hmm. CD fix an FS tab file and reboot and hope for the best. We're talking about being able to actually run things on that hard drive cool. from this environment. Let's try, just for example, apt-get update. I'm root, remember? So I don't need to type sudo anymore because that's only to give me temporary root access. Okay, I'm getting my app get update. Here we go. Okay, done. No errors. apt get. Let's let's do an apt. Let's just do it. Let's just fix this bad boy. Oh, apt not? cache search Linux image. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to search for Linux headers. There we go. This is what apt get tells me. I've got oh. all these headers available to me. So let's pick one that's going to be good. Mm -hmm. Let's say 3.2.04. Okay. So if that's the kernel header that we want, let's see if there's a meta package that will just let us select 686. Let's do, you're going to need the kernel that's appropriate for your system. And I'm going to make the assumption here that you kind of know a little bit about systems and architectures. So I know, for example, that I've got a moder modern system that's 32-bit, right? So I'm going to go with the 686 kernel with PAE extensions because my, my processor supports that. 
if you're not sure, um, you can go with a different kernel. AMD 64 is the 64-bit kernel, right? But I know that I'm running a 32-bit system with PAE, so I can grab that one. So let's copy that to my clipboard, okay? And now, apt-get install, and then I've hit Alt-E for edit, and then I can hit paste, okay? So it's going to actually install that kernel, but where is it installing it? It's actually installing that kernel on my real Linux mm. installation. It's not doing it on my live CD, right? Interesting. Yeah. Huh. There you go. And wow. it's working. There it goes. There you go. Just kind of letting you see this in real time. Updating. Now, this is the one thing that's going to take a little bit longer. It's going to mm -hmm. create an init RD image file for the kernel itself. So let's sing a song, because this is the moment of truth. <laughs> Will it work or this won't is, it? This is some advanced nerdiness here, folks. Some advanced enhanced nerdiness. Oh, I'd say. Some people in the chat room are, are a little, uh, they're into it, but they're like, man, this is intense. But that's the beauty of the show. You watch it again and again and again. You can pause it, watch it again until you get it, right? It's meant to be intense. We have intense music. <laughs> we do. Yeah. So I'm going to think I'm giving away a prize now when I do that. No, sorry. sorry no prize. prize. Just no free prize knowledge. Just now. Free knowledge. That's all we can do. Here it goes. It's coming along. Hey, there you go. You know, when it happens to you, you're going to look back at this video and go, I am so glad I know how to CH root. Because it's going to happen where you need it. Mm -hmm. You know it exists. You're going to go to category5.tv. Yes. You're going to do a little search on the right-hand side there for CH root. <laughs> you're going to find this video, and you're going to get a step-by-step -step tutorial with copy and paste text in the show notes. He's with a all genius, the commands. this guy over here. Genius. User-friendly people. She said it, so I'm allowed to repeat it. <laughs> I'm so kidding. Okay, <laughs> so that's done, Okay. So now, remember that I'm still on the system. We did a, you know, we did CD slash boot, and we did an LS, and what did we see? No kernel. Now let's try. Hmm. Oh! We have a kernel! Hooray! And I'm not talking about chicken. Or popcorn. No popcorn stuck in our teeth. <laughs> All right. Can I reboot this system, and we're going to see what happens? Ooh. So back at my, my, you know, this drive... On my CD, I'm going to just simply do a restart. There we go. Let's let it boot up and see what happens. Magic for our very eyes, people. It's called Linux, folks. <laughs> there it goes. It's going to need me to remove the CD, so I need to do that as soon as it's ready. Real-time magic, where if I have to wait, you have to wait. Mm -hmm. Hey, careful. Copyright. I only did two two notes. Yes, and, I, and everyone recognized it. <laughs> two Please notes. Please remove the disc. Hey, there there's only go. there's only like a few notes in the musical alphabet. Okay. Yeah, especially if you're a modern band. <laughs> there you go. Look at that. It's detected. Now I'm booting from my hard drive. Now it's detected the kernel which I installed. That's the three dot two dot o dash four six eighty six pie. Let's hit enter. And ladies and gentlemen. No error message. Ooh. Booting right up. Booting right up. It's going to come up. Oh, yeah. Mm. I have full confidence in my abilities. I have confidence in your <laughs> abilities as well. Well, it's working. There you go. <laughs> if I can be fair. It was a lot more complicated the first time I had to do it. I can imagine. So I had to, uh, I had to relay this knowledge. Send it down the internet ways to you well the world appreciates it mm -hmm. i know they do mm -hmm. you will when it happens to you yeah hopefully it's booting it's a black screen right now but it's coming oh there's my cursor oh Whoa. and there we go Hooray. and it is narf dog narf dog in the house there you go there's my computer folks raring to go it's up and running beautiful disaster averted thank goodness does this work on Fedora? Does this work on Arc? Does this work on Manjaro or Debian or Ubuntu or any other distro? Absolutely. Ooh. 
your commands may be a little bit different. You need to be familiar with your own package manager. I used AppGet, right? Because I'm on a Debian-based mm -hmm. system. Ubuntu is the same thing. So Ubuntu, exactly the same commands. Just where I put SDA2, that's why we ran fdisk-l, the first command, so that you could get a list of your partitions. It's going to be different with your computer, most likely. Okay, So keep in mind. And there we go. System's up and running. Beautiful. Back in the game. Perfect. Wonderful. That is how to ch root your system, folks. Now we know. You learned it here on Category 5 Technology TV. And uh, it's time. It is time. It's for time the for the news. And these are the top stories from the Category 5.tv newsroom. The National Security Agency is harvesting huge numbers of images of people from communications that it intercepts through its global surveillance operations for use in sophisticated facial recognition programs, according to a top secret document. The spy agency's reliance on facial recognition technology has grown significantly over the last four years as the agency has turned to new software to exploit the flood of images included in emails, text messages, social media, video conferences, and other communications, the NSA documents reveal. Agency officials believe that technological advances could revolutionize the way that the NSA finds intelligence targets around the world, the document shows. The agency's ambitions for this highly sensitive ability and the scale of its efforts have not previously been disclosed. Hmm. Remember when this guy was up behind us? <laughs> the technology exists, folks. Remember when he was up on the shelf just oh. behind us? He was kind of back here. There he was. Okay. Mm. We get pictures of the show, which we put up on our yes, social media do. profiles and things. We have an intervalometer up there that takes a picture every 10 seconds. And Hi. so one of these times <laughs> it's going to get us smiling. But I uploaded one of those pictures where our Spock bobblehead was way back here. I uploaded it to Twitter. Mm -hmm. And Twitter, when it uploaded, yeah. asked me, do you want to tag Leonard Nimoy? What? Excuse me? And it was his official Leonard Nimoy account account on Twitter. What? It was back here. Our cameras no. are not that crystal clear. Come on. The technology exists. Ooh. The NSA is just stepping uh, stepping up their stuff. They've seen person of interest. They want that. <laughs> it's freaking me out. I'm just saying that did kind of freak me out. And I That's thought, freaky weird. oh man, because everything that you post is permanent. You can't oh, delete yeah. things from the internet anymore, folks. Nope. Sorry. It's out there. Be careful what you post. But they're talking about actually <laughs> monitoring telecommunications on online. I don't use no a telephone forms. anymore. Not that voice over IP has been compromised or is mm -hmm. in bed with the NSA or anything like that, but... Do we have to fear mm. as we're going more and more that way that we're no longer on landlines? We're using everything through the internet. Who knows? My face is all over the place. Your face I know. is just all over the place. Got to keep a low Go profile. Google Go Google Robbie Ferguson and see what you come up with. All good things, I hope. Well, I hope so. <laughs> Speaking of telecommunications. Our next story. And oh. NSA involvement. <laughs> Revolves Whoops, around did such. Did he go there? Here we go. Oh, boy. Like TARDIS or Universal Translator, Microsoft has unveiled a real-time language translation feature for its internet phone service, Skype. Nice. Chief Executive Satya Nadella said the firm would launch a test version of the service, dubbed Skype Translator, for Windows 8 later this year. The move comes as competition in the internet-based phone service sector. Um, because it's been rising, forcing firms to look at the ways to attract more users. According to Microsoft, Skype currently has 300 million users, um, oh, monthly users globally. And as we know from SharePoint, Microsoft never fobs the numbers. Microsoft did not say if the service will be offered for free or if users will have to pay a fee. Hmm. What people don't realize, Hill, is that we are actually speaking French. These microphones are <laughs> universal translators. We're from Canada, right? Canada. You know that all we do is speak French. Maybe. A universal translator, though, a la TARDIS. 
Or I think about Star Trek's universal communicator pins. And <laughs> the fact that you hear, if yeah. I can have a Skype video conversation with you, they've had it in the chat, you know, typing right. chat for quite mm-hmm. some time. And it's been revolutionary. But imagine somebody's voice yeah. being morphed into your native language. Very interesting. That's amazing. And then does that technology then say, now we can take Category 5 to Germany in your Ooh. native tongue? Could we use that kind of technology? Can we, as in the industry, use mm-hmm. that kind of technology? Wouldn't that be crazy amazing? Might not be good as hiring actors to do our voices. <laughs> Bonjour, je m'appelle Robin Ferguson. That was a really bad actor. We fired him. Oh, he yeah. was horrible. Oh. Interesting <laughs> stuff, though, to think about. It's kind of wild. I love that line of technology. Mm-hmm. Fascinating stuff. But it does ra- it raises so many questions when we're afraid of privacy. Obviously, the communication has to be monitored in order to be translated by super fast computers. Yeah, hello which can do how many operations per second? How real time is it? What's the latency? Who is listening in on our discussions? I know. Freaky guys, we're going to have to go back to the days of carrier pigeons. Carrier pigeons. That are probably monitored. The NSA would shoot them down. Oh, who knows? Who knows? In other news... Imagine driving down the highway at 70 miles per hour when suddenly the wheel turns hard right and you crash. And this accident was because somebody hacked your car. Yikes. Freaky. But it's not a far-fetched science fiction notion. It's the near-term future today's hackers are warned about. Most people aren't aware that their cars are already high-tech computers, realistically, and now we're networking them by giving them wireless connectivity. Yet, there's a danger to turning your car into a smartphone on wheels. It makes them a powerful target for hackers. Mm. Ed Adams is a researcher at Security Innovation, a company that tests the safety of automobiles. Referring to the computers and software used to um, power today's cars, he says, auto manufacturers are not up to speed. They're just behind the times. Car software is not built to the same standards as, say, a bank application or software coming out of Microsoft. The nightmare scenario. Hackers access your car's core controls by breaching its internet-connected entertainment system and tamper with your brakes. But cars are going wireless, and that means wires won't be needed to hack them. Hmm. That's a scary thought. Petrifying, actually. We brought up on the show a couple weeks ago about how they were developing a system to mm-hmm. safely get you off the road and event, whatever, right? But now, and now we all know, uh, we didn't even have to bring it up in the newsroom because everybody knows about Google's um, uh, autonomous cars. You've seen those, have you? Mm-hmm. So, like, they've actually developed cars with <laughs> no steering wheel, Freaky. no pedals, just a bubble on wheels mm-hmm. that drives by itself. So, what is to stop somebody from I, I mean it's obviously a good target for hackers or governments or you know control or organizations not, like not a movie we're not conspiracy theorists here I'm we're, it's a it, it's a potential that's news that that's, people need to consider right and I think where things fall apart is that with vehicles we're looking at an industry that has has um, accelerated, no pun intended, its technology mm-hmm. at a rate faster than they have the understanding of those technologies in such a way, if that makes sense, in such a way that your car, while it has incredibly sophisticated technology, like they're developing in the Wi Fi technologies and things, it also incorporates things that are so old as far as the technological advancement goes, mm-hmm. right? So, why couldn't somebody who can get into your sound system, say, through wireless, then tap into your brakes, which are incredibly unsophisticated in comparison? Right. right? Why can't malware get into your dashboard computer mm-hmm. and then take over some of the things that normally you would control? But then taking it to the very far extreme are those Google cars and any other autonomous car where you don't even have control where if something goes wrong you can't grab the wheel 
Mm. So interesting. I'm just envisioning a, a made-for-TV movie in my mind. Let's start making it. <laughs> Made-for-the-internet movie. Made for the internet. Ah, ah, I'm trying to drive my car. <laughs> it's not driving the way I tell it to. And then you'd be like, ah, <laughs> controlling you with my iPod. Coming soon. And then the I will be like, you. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> just like that. Sounds good to me. I'm creative in other ways. Don't yes. be a hater. <laughs> this little story was sent in to us by Tennessee Frank. Oh, hey, TN Frank. Google's plans for satellite-based <laughs> internet access just got a little bit more concrete. The Wall Street Journal hears that the search firm is preparing to build 180 small, high-capacity satellites. Not wow. mentioned here. Um, that will go into low orbit and provide internet connections to un uh, sorry underserved areas. While details aren't forthcoming about these machines, there may be more on the way. Reportedly, the company could double its vehicle count if all goes well. A spokeswoman didn't confirm or deny the efforts, but did note that having an internet link significantly improves hmm. people's lives. Yeah, okay. Well, what was the news a month ago? We're bringing the internet to the forest, <laughs> right? Oh, the campgrounds? But, yeah, yes. like campgrounds mm -hmm. in the middle. I don't know if you've heard this where you're from, but here in Canada, it's a big deal where people yeah. go to places like Algonquin Park specifically to get away from tech, right? We're there to see the moose. Right. And they're bringing internet, Wi-Fi. Well, this, and people are outraged and people, you know, mm -hmm. don't want internet where they no. are in the middle of the woods hiking and things. This is going to be unstoppable. Well, it doesn't matter where you are now. We got a satellite over your head. Cool. Owned and operated by Google. Hmm. All right. They've got these new cars coming out that are internet connected. So that's convenient. Hmm. Monitoring of positions through satellites. 180 of them. What's Google's involvement with NSA? I said we're not conspiracy theorists, but this is getting crazy. I don't know. And they've got all these robots that they're building, it's which are going to be internet connective. This is a movie, guys. I've this seen it before. About Yeah. Can somebody please bring this to Hollywood? Cast A us. company we're that willing. makes robots and robotic cars is going to have satellites in their control that will be able to communicate with every device on the face of the earth, Ooh. no matter where it is. I'm freaking myself out. Cue ominous music. Well, you can get these full stories online if you're interested <laughs> in learning a little bit more. Category5.tv slash newsroom. The Category5.tv newsroom is researched by Rory W. Nash with contributions from our awesome community of viewers. If you have a story you think's worthy of on-air mention, send us an email at newsroom at Category5.tv. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Hillary Rumble. Thanks, Hill. No problem. Tonight. I'm just responding in the chat room here. That's okay. There's lots of there interesting go, stuff going on. Yeah. I mean, we just had a hey, busy show and we got, this has been busy. We got 13 it's minutes to save the world here. Well, can we say hi to a couple of people? We certainly can. Hello. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, Flo, again, for watching. Yeah. Hello, Stripe. Hello, Big Red 1275. Who else we got here today? Let's take a look at our live viewer location map. This oh, is always I love this. It's so interesting to me. It's fascinating. Washington in Baltimore. Nice to see you. In Monterey. And Munich. Hmm. We got viewers. We have viewers. We have viewers all over the world. All over the world. And in fact, I've been... Uh, you know, even just even just hearing from you in Nigeria and realizing that you're watching the show in Nigeria and from around the world, our viewers in China and, of course, our viewers in the United States. We have a very large viewership in the United States. In Canada, we are, uh, you know, taking over the taking over the uh, the whole northern hemisphere. Oh, yeah. That's pretty cool. You can go to our website, category5.tv, if you want to see that. Or it's just map.cat5.tv. gives you a mm -hmm. nice overview of where people are watching Look from. Look at that. There we go. That's the zoomed out version. And yeah, we see you. 
So we see you there, really world. Nice to have you. I see Ethiopia there, and of course, you know, you guys, you're just I can't even see your country names, everybody. No, Germany's in there somewhere. <laughs> Ireland. We get in there. We can, oh look, the Czech Republic has appeared, and Switzerland, and France. So we love y'all. Cool. Very cool. Thanks for watching Category Five TV. We love it. <laughs> we love it, and we love you. Speaking and of kind of you know the the overview mm-hmm. of our world and looking at our viewer location map, something that NASA has been doing, and something that I find incredibly cool. And <laughs> and I've maybe I, I think it's NASA. Maybe it's not. But regardless, have you seen the video live from the International Space Station yet? I have not, to be honest. I have been I wanting have to mention this on the show. And so what I've actually done is I've made up a, a quick little hot link for you just oh, to get cool. there real easy. Cat5.tv slash ISS cam for the International Space Station cam. What it is is that they've actually put HD webcams, internet connected, probably to a Google satellite. Who knows? Mm -hmm. It's in beta testing on the space station. And so you can actually see now when it's gray, that means that it's currently connected to a camera that's not connecting Mm -hmm. or it's switching between cameras. So hopefully we'll get to see something. But you can go there. Cat5.tv slash ISS cam. Blow it up full screen. Right now it's an incredibly Mm -hmm. boring gray window. (laughs) Earlier today, I could see the flyover of the Earth. And it is really, really cool. And it's interesting to watch the chat room, too, and realize that this is really bringing people together on a global scale. Mm -hmm. And the example here tonight, as you can see, is really unimpressive. (laughs) But if you can imagine, I'll leave it up just uh, for a couple of moments, just in case um, it's about to switch cameras. Um, And, of course, because of the the way that the space station goes around the world, orbits the Earth, Mm -hmm. um, you're going to see a sun up, sunrise, sunset a couple that times an hour cool. kind of thing so it's it's really really neat especially if you catch it during daytime their time so that you can mm. actually see everything it's beautiful so kind of puts things into perspective in a lot of ways so cat5.tv slash iss cam incredibly boring as i try to demonstrate <laughs> it tonight because it's gray well, which we'll see. as we know from reading over the quick notes that if it's gray camera's down hmm. which is acceptable considering they're in space solid their internet may not be as reliable as here on E Pluribus Unum. There you have it, folks. Mm. <laughs> there you go. Well, we'll stay tuned. I'm eagerly, I'm watching the corner of my eye, waiting for something to happen or aliens to yeah, pop up yeah, or we'll something. Keep that up. Well, we're going to jump into viewer questions just for, Certainly. Uh, you know, I know that we have a couple there. Uh, tonight's show is brought to you in part by Belltone. Uh, you can learn why Belltone is the choice of millions of users when it comes to fantastic hearing care. Check out Belltone first. It's a revolutionary, made-for-iPhone hearing aid. Visit Belltone.com or call 1-800-BELLTONE now for your free trial. Very cool. I like that. I also like questions. Indeed. This one comes to us from Don. Hey, Don. And um, I think he might have written to you before, but he said, I couldn't find a way to connect yet in Pigeon. I don't know if this is, is this regards to the... Chat room. The Pigeon chat room. is for chat. Right. Yeah. Okay. I can watch the show uh, weekly live on my Roku and use my laptop to connect to Category 5 chat room from the website. So he'll, he'll try that next time. Awesome. I guess that wasn't a question. All right. Well, in the meantime, go over to (laughs) category5.tv, click on Interact, Chat Room, and you'll see that there is some help there that will give you some instructions on how to get Pigeon set up. Also, there's a video that if you click on Help, you'll be able to watch Eric and I demonstrate how to set up Pigeon. Very cool. cool. He also has a nice little comment here. Went back to the beginning of this year um, to look at the prior shows. Mm. And um, he's using Manjaro Gnome, and he's been loving it cool. since it's a rolling release, and it keeps me current with stable, updated software. Mm-hmm. And he's a self-taught user at age 66, and has had no Very technical good. training, so he enjoys trying and testing new ideas. So thank you for the show. Way to go, Don. Thanks for the email. And uh, it's so it. nice to have you as a part of our community here at Category 5. We Thanks for it. sending that in. I think I have some more little comments. We, sure. we have time for like I think so, yeah. We've got about fanfare. five and a half minutes. Okay. So, um, where 
where did it go? I had this little comment. She's looking. Okay. She sees you. Tony. Hey, Tony. Says, I started watching Category 5 on my Roku at Easter, and it was coming through well. He has a Roku 2 and watches an SD um, cool. using composite video. Nice. Uh, I do the same. That's what I love about oh. my Roku 2 is you can connect it through the RCA cables. It doesn't have to be HDMI. And when you do that, it automatically detects that you're on an SD Mm, screen smart. so it streams to you the sd signal rather than the hd signal down sampled so you actually save bandwidth that way and it looks great That's on a cool. crt tv looks fantastic hmm. interesting Sorry. no proceed just, well he's just just commenting that um started with the roku intro and then went oh, ahead yes. to episode 342 Yes, I got Flickr, but I think everyone did. But it was not very distracting. Oh, back with the camera. Yeah, we're raising money to get a new camera. Tonight we're using a webcam again. And it's looking pretty good tonight. But we get this crazy thing where, you know, we have this crazy fisheye effect almost. It's like a super zoom. So if we put our hands out, we basically look like crazy hands. Oh, crazy hands. There you go. just the way the lens works. Anyways, just a nice little comment here about watching us on Roku. Cool. Another way to tune in. Very and watch cool. The show. We love having Roku as a part of our, you know, way of watching Category Five TV. And mm-hmm. I know that there's a lot of people that are watching the show through Roku, so we appreciate you. Uh, we do, and I'm sorry. I just I got a lot of cool She's got comments. A lot of emails and comments coming through. And you guys sure. always write such nice like essays here. <laughs> I'd appreciate maybe like a one or two liner, uh, but uh, that's okay here. Um, this comment actually comes to us from Orange Man from Ireland. Hey, Orange Man. And I guess he wrote to you before about mm. um, using Microsoft Virtual XP on Windows 7. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. He yeah, said, yeah. found a box from Maplin Electronics Cat 5e inline uh, coupler for networks. Oh, yeah. And when I want to use Virtual XP, I take the cable out of the Cat5e inline coupler, so disabling the network and internet. I have to turn off my sure, wireless. Okay. This makes it safe to use when uh, using Virtual XP. So I guess it's just right. kind of a follow up. Yeah, to yeah, his yeah. Prior so he's physically issue. unplugging the cable mm-hmm. from Windows XP. I'm going to show you something really, really quick, Orange Man. Here's VirtualBox and here's XP. What I can do, rather than having to physically disable the cable, I can actually go in here to my settings and go network. And I can just disable it by unchecking enable network adapter. And then when I hit OK, there's no more networking in my computer. Windows XP no longer has network. Big news in the chat room. They're letting us know that we've got video over at the ISS. <gasps> this is cat5.tv slash ISS cam. And as you can see, it's beautiful HD video coming off of the International, uh, International Space Station. Uh, you got to check that out. I mean, it's... Look at that world. You want to put on some classical music or something <laughs> and just check out what's going on with our world. It's just like, look at that. It's That's incredible. the view that Mark Shuttleworth had when he was up there. So you just can't beat that. Cat5.tv slash ISS Cam. That's all the time that we have, folks. Thanks for joining us tonight. This is Category 5 Technology TV and our website, as you see down there, is www.category5.tv. Follow us on Twitter. Get all the links off of our website. We're on Facebook. We're on Google+. Plus. Oh, uh, yeah. If you sign up, you know, follow us on those uh, social media platforms. You get notifications when the show's going to go live and all that kind of stuff. Plus, if you register on our website, category5.tv, we'll actually gladly send you an email at your request just with the helpful little checkbox that says... Remind me. <laughs> Don't want to miss the show. Remind me. That's and we'll send cool. you an email an hour before the show. And uh, and after the show, we'll even send you all the files so that you can watch it if you miss it, if you happen to be unavailable at the time. Very cool. We don't want you to miss out. Sure don't. I love it. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Thanks, Phil. Thanks for the memories, guys. And I hope you learned something today. Hope you had fun. And if you did, send us a little email. Send us a little comment. We'd love to hear from you. I know we've got lots of viewer questions that have been coming in lately. Uh, We do our best to keep up with it. Keep them coming live at category5.tv or head on over to our website. You'll see on Interact there's an Ask a Question button. Mm -hmm. And uh, usually what happens, we will put together a viewer question extravaganza to get through the mailbag if uh, if we fall too far behind. And that's kind of looking like where we're headed. So thank you, everyone, for sending in your questions. If you haven't heard from us yet, uh, you know why. So we're uh, keeping up with it. 
thanks everybody for tuning in and i'll see you next tuesday night Mm -hmm. good night bye have a great week everybody we hope you enjoyed the show category 5 tv broadcasts live from barrie ontario canada every tuesday at 7 p.m eastern if you're watching this on demand or through cable TV, check out the local showtimes in your area at Category5.tv and find out when you can watch live and interact in the community chat room. Category 5 is a production of Prodigy Digital Solutions and is licensed under Creative Commons Attribution 2.5 Canada. We'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in.